Dr. Jasti Singh, who is in Toronto, has now agreed to step in and give her talk. And her talk is on the control of HIV infection in vivo using gene therapy with a secreted entry inhibitor. And just to mention that Jasti is one of the uh, organizers of the local BSI um, chapter and has been uh, very important in helping us get this conference up and running. So over to you, Jasti. All right. So thank you, Dr. Fish, for the introduction. And thank you to my colleagues on the BSI team for giving me the opportunity to present my work today. The work I'll be talking about is the culmination of my PhD that I recently graduated from. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, and we'll be looking at a strategy to combat HIV infection using gene therapeutic approaches. Now, HIV is an interesting case of infectious disease because we're more than 30 years into the pandemic and we continue to see that HIV infection is spreading worldwide with over 30 million individuals infected across the globe. And that's not to say that treatment options don't exist. In fact, our best treatment efforts in the clinic include a combination of drugs collectively termed CART. And these, and these drugs are able to enhance survival of patients who have access to treatment. However, one of the detrimental or kind of limitations of CART is that these drugs require strict daily administration. So you can imagine that lifelong adherence is often impaired due to accumulating costs, short-term side effects, and long-term toxicity. And so in the absence of a cure or a treatment for HIV infection, it's clear that we now need to look for um, treatments or continue to uh, make efforts towards looking for an option that is both well-tolerated and long-lasting in nature. So this brings us, and this brought us to the idea of gene therapy as a potential way to combat HIV infection, because gene therapy has already successfully been used in a variety of clinical cases, including X-linked SCID, hemophilia B, as well as many others. Now you can imagine that Genetic treatment for HIV infection as an alternative to CART would mean lifelong, lifelong expression of a therapeutic gene after a single treatment dose. And in, any, in many ways, that's advantageous over continuous drug administration. Now, as a proof of principle is this infamous case of Timothy Ray Brown or the Berlin patient, which gained a lot of media attention because Timothy Ray Brown was an individual who had the misfortune of being diagnosed with both acute myeloid leukemia and he was infected with HIV. Now, as part of an experimental sort of trial, clinicians were able to give <coughs> Timothy a bone marrow transplant, but specifically this, these bone marrow cells had a genetic mutation against one of the um, HIV co-receptors, CCR5. And so what this meant for Timothy was that after receiving the bone marrow transplant for his AML, he was HIV um, resistant for a long period of time, even after the cessation of CART treatment. And so in our strategy, we're similarly harnessing the potential of the hematopoietic stem cell, which showed success in the context of the Berlin patient, where now we're looking to gene modify in our laboratory environment, this HSC. And HSCs are an attractive, um, are an attractive option for gene therapeutic approaches because they lie at the very top of the immune hierarchy as shown here. These are the only cell types of the immune system that are capable of both self renewal as well as differentiation into all of the immune lineages shown here. However, in current HIV gene therapy approaches using hematopoietic stem cells. Most groups rely on things like developing CCR5 um, T cell mutants. And so really, if you look at the entire immune system as a whole, this relies on one small branch of the immune system, which often reconstitutes at very low levels following hematopoietic stem cell transplants. And in our, in our approach, what we wanted to do was not only harness the ability of the gene modified T cell, but really go towards the goal of establishing a gene-modified immune system. And so the way we decided to do this was through the use of interfering proteins. 
which have the ability to target various steps of the HIV entry cycle. So when HIV enters a cell, um, HIV envelope GP120 normally binds to the CD4 receptor on the host cell, which is often immune cell type known as T cells. And upon receptor engagement, there is a conformational change in GP120 exposing these sites capable of binding CCR5 and CXCR4 HIV co-receptors. And upon binding of both receptors and co-receptors, there's another conformational change exposing these two domains shown here, known as peptide repeats, one and two, so HR1 and HR2. And it's critical that these domains are often exposed for viral and host cell membrane fusion. And this is how HIV fundamentally infects its target cells. Now in our strategy, we decided to focus on a specific step of the HIV entry cycle, and that is the receptor binding step, which is highly, highly, highly conserved. So within our approach, we utilize this construct shown here, where we have encoding a soluble CD4 domain, as well as a downstream ZS screen reporter, and that'll become important later on. But soluble CD4 is virtually like the CD4 molecule expressed on host cells, except that it's a truncated mutant. So it only has domains one and two, whereas the normal CD4 molecule has domains three and four as well. So fundamentally, we're expecting that it'll serve as a decoy to the receptor binding step. And I'll remind you that really the benefit of this approach as compared to current approaches is that even with a low level of gene marking in virtually any cell of the immune lineage, whether it be a B cell, a T cell, or a myeloid cell, we are able to achieve large or uh, sufficient levels of soluble CD4 circulating in the bloodstream to protect not only the gene modified producer cells, but also unmodified HIV target cells. And without showing you some of this data today, I'll tell you that we've already, in collaboration with um, Dr. Alexander Falkenhagen at U of T, we've already been able to validate this construct in a variety of T cell, B cell, and myeloid cell lines, so various lines of different immune system components. So moving forward, the real question that we had was whether we could use this construct to gene modify hematopoietic stem cells. And again, those cells are the important ones because they lie at the very top of the hematopoietic hierarchy. So here in Toronto, we have access to a rich source of human stem cells, and that is human umbilical cord blood. And through a variety of approaches and optimized protocols for transduction, we utilized a cytokine cocktail and our viral constructs of interest to see if we could effectively gene modify human hematopoietic stem cells. And what we saw was very nice. So if we look at the control here, which is an untransduced control, no virus added, we see that there is no ZS green reporter activity. And if we turn our attention to the soluble CD4 encoding construct, which I mentioned has the ZS green reporter encoded within it as well, we can see very, very nice gene modification. So around 35% of human stem cells effectively pick up our construct. So following this, we had a good idea that human stem cells can be gene modified with our construct in this way. And the key questions we wanted to ask in a variety of in vitro assays was whether these gene modified cells had the ability to differentiate into different immune system components. So without showing you the data in the interest of time, I will tell you that we were able to develop T cells in vitro, B cells in vitro, and myeloid cells in vitro. And they all started from this gene modified hematopoietic stem cell we were able to make. So this was exciting because not only were these cells able to differentiate and maintain their capacity as stem cells, they also secreted high levels of soluble CD4, not only at the stem cell level, but also at the progeny level. So the real question we wanted to ask was, is this effective in vivo? Because ultimately that is the goal as we move towards the clinic. And we're quite limited ethically in terms of the types of models we can use for studying these approaches. So we turned our attention to a nice preclinical model that we often use here in Canada, 
which is a mouse model. And you can imagine that there's a lot of differences between human and mice. But one of the great aspects of this model is we're able to fundamentally recapitulate many of the immune lineages that are present in humans in a mouse. And these mouse specifically are immunodeficient so that they're able to uptake our cell grafts. So just kind of fundamentally, I'll be calling these mice NSG mice, but they're just immunodeficient mice able to engraft our human stem cells. And so moving forward, we decided to test this and test how our cells will perform in vivo. And so once again, we isolated hematopoietic stem cells from umbilical cord blood. We transduced them, this time with an empty vector control or a soluble CD4 encoding construct. And then we reconstituted these immunodeficient NSG mice with a mixture of both gene modified as well as unmodified populations. And I'll remind you that that's important because we wanted to understand whether the unmodified cells, which don't encode for soluble CD4, would also be protected in our model. And so what we did next was we waited. And we waited about five months before we could really get a readout of how effective our approach was. So after five months, we basically checked for how well do the immune lineages reconstitute within our mice. And a soluble CD4, in fact, secreted. And what we saw was the following. So if we look at control versus soluble CD4 expressing mice, we can see that if we look across the immune lineages, including the complete CD45 positive immune um, compartment or CD19 positive B cells, CD3 positive T cells, or different T cell subsets, we see virtually no difference between control mice and soluble CD4 expressing mice. So this was encouraging. The next question we had was whether our therapeutic molecule of interest, soluble CD4, was in fact expressed. So we did a his tagged ELISA, and what you can see here is that as compared to background in the control, we have about 0.1 micrograms per mil of soluble CD4 that are detectable in the serum of our mice. So fundamentally, we have the right cells there. We have CD4 positive HIV target cells. We have soluble CD4 our immune product of, or our therapeutic product of interest present. So the real question was, how do these mice perform once we infect them with HIV? So here what I'm showing you is a profile of the viral load of these mice over time post-infection. And what's very remarkable and clear is that over time, if we look at control mice, that have no soluble CD4, their viral load tends to stay the same or increase a bit. However, in the presence of soluble CD4, our immunotherapeutic product of interest, we see a trend towards viral load decrease over time. And this is in fact consistent with the, solid, with the CD4 T cell counts, again, because HIV does infect CD4 positive T cells. And what we see is that in the control mice that have the increasing viral load, the CD4 T cell counts are decreasing over time. And if we look at the soluble CD4 expressing mice, we see that the CD4 T cell compartment is nicely maintained. And that's shown again here through flow cytometry. So what we see at this point is protection of the CD4 T cell compartment in the blood. We see a decrease in viral load. So the last thing we did at the end of this experiment is we decided to turn our attention to important immune organs, so the thymus, the spleen, and the bone marrow. And what we see in all cases is that in the soluble CD4 expressing mice, there seems to be an increase of CD4 positive T cells if we look at the CD4 to CD8 T cell ratio. So it seems that soluble CD4 does have a promising protective effect, even at the level of these organs. And so bringing things to an end, what I've shown you so far is that human hematopoietic stem progenitor cells, they can be gene modified effectively using our construct of interest. And they're able to retain their multi-lineage differentiation capacity when transplanted in vivo. Interestingly enough and sort of promising is the fact that these cells are also able to secrete soluble CD4. And in an HIV infection model within immunodeficient mice, we see that the soluble CD4 is in fact protective. And so we've been following up on these studies since, 
in exploring a variety of different biosystronic um, constructs to not only inhibit HIV entry at the receptor binding step, but also potentially to target the different steps of HIV entry. And right now what we've seen is that gene modification with a lot of these constructs shown here is quite possible. So we have yet to test them in an infection model to see if we can virtually eliminate the HIV viral load in these mice. And so with that, I'd like to thank my former PhD mentor, Dr. Juan Carlos Zuniga Flicker and our entire lab. A lot of this work was done in collaboration with Dr. Alexander Falkenhagen um, at the University of Toronto. And I'd like to thank our sources of funding, and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jasti. So um, actually, I have a question for you. So you mentioned that uh, when you looked in various organs in these mice, there was an increase in uh, CD4 T cell. Do you anticipate this being persistent, or how long lasting might this be? Right, so that's one of, that's a very good question, and it's something we've sort of been trying to investigate further as well. Um, we've been able to take it as far as possible um, in the mouse model. So the maximal effects we can achieve are by 20 weeks post engraftment. And just by virtue of the limitations of the model, engraftment tends to go down after that time point. So to be honest, we don't have an answer to that right now. And we don't know if over time there's a greater effect. That's a very good question. Thank you very much. That was a, a great talk. And if you have any questions, please post them um, on the chat room and uh, Jesse will be able to see them and respond.